Hey, here it is, December 31st, the last day of 2023. Guess what's happening? 21 days of prayer starts tomorrow, prayer and fasting. Um, just believing for God to do some incredible things in 2024. Hey, building is looking good. This is gonna be the year that we get into it. We're shooting for August, so just be praying for that, believing for God to do just some amazing things this year coming up. Hey, and guess what happens? In just a couple weeks, January 14th, we're celebrating 14 years. Come on, 14th, 14 years. You're not gonna wanna miss it. We're gonna just celebrate, thank God for everything that he's done, everything he's gonna do, so grateful. Hey, this morning, you don't have to hear me. You get to hear the big guns today, all right? We're breaking out the big guns. Miss Devin Granger is bringing the word for you. So sit back. I know you got your coffee. You're sitting on the couch. You're relaxing, whatever it is, playing with all the Christmas gifts. Hey, here it comes. Here we go. Good morning and welcome, Coastal. I hope that you had an amazing Christmas and I hope you're having a great time with your family this morning. I am excited to bring the message this morning and also a little nervous. For those of you who know me, you know that this is not my comfort zone, but it is good for us to get out of our comfort zone a little bit, get stretched, uh, and it's a little bit about what I'm gonna share with you today. So first, I wanna start off by asking you a question. Have you ever seen clay being shaped from nothing or a block of ice being sculpted into a beautiful sculpture? To me, it's a pretty amazing uh, thing to watch. But what if you and I were the clay and the ice? Do you think that maybe at times it would be a little bit uncomfortable, even painful? Do y'all see where I'm going with this? If we don't allow the pain and the discomfort, we don't get to see the beautiful sculpture at the end, right? The masterpiece. And our goal as Christians is to become more like Christ. And so today I am calling this growing pains. In Isaiah 64, eight, it says, you Lord are our father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. And Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so another sharpens another. These are the two main scriptures that I'm gonna focus on today. And the two ideas is first, we are shaped by God. And secondly, we are sharpened by others. So what does this have to do with growing pains, you might ask? Well, I believe that God uses this shaping and this sharpening to grow us, to develop us more into his image but as I mentioned before, it's probably going to be a little bit uncomfortable. There might be some pain involved. But it's exactly what we need to happen in order to grow and to develop into who he has created us to be. So first I'm going to start out by talking about being shaped by God. And I think there are several ways that uh, things that God uses in circumstances that he uses to shape us. But we're just going to focus on three today. And the first I believe has to be our foundation, and I believe it's the Word of God, the Bible. Matthew 7, 24 says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. We know that when you're building something, you have to have the right foundation. Our foundation is the Word of God. It has to be. It's the only truth that we have to stand on. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed. It is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So this teaching, this training, this correcting that the word brings us, it is our outline. It is our um, boundary that is shaping us what to do, what not to do. And 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, it says, The word of God, which is at work in you who believes. So his, his word, the Bible, is actively working in us. The more we read it, the more we get into it, it is changing us. It is shaping us from the inside out. It's so important to be in the word of God. Next thing that I feel like shapes us is our prayer and our worship time. Prayer is the communion 
communion and communication with God, and worship is the expression of reverence and adoration for God. So how can we be in communion with God and have this reverence towards our holy God and not be changed by that experience, not be changed by being in the presence of Him? When Moses was in the presence of God, it says that his face literally shone like a bright light. We don't get to see that today, too bad, right? But we know by faith that when we're in his presence, we are being changed. So many times in the book of Psalms, we read story after story of the writer pouring out his heart and everything's going wrong and everything's falling apart, right? But when he stops and he prays or he stops and he sings a worship song, something changes, the situation changes, right? In chapter 42, it talks about, now I am deeply discouraged, but I will remember you, O God, my rock. I cry, why have you forgotten me? Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by the enemies? Their taunts break my bones. And then as he's crying out to God and he's praying this prayer, something starts to change and his words change a little bit later on in the chapter and it says, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my savior and my God. Here we see that him just being honest and crying out to God in his prayer changes his heart. I don't know about you, but for me, there's so many times like on a Sunday morning, for example, where I'm running around and I've got all these things to do and all these worries and checklists going on in my head, right? And then the service begins, the band starts to play, and I enter into worship. And what happens in that time of worship, all my cares start to go away. I can refocus, recenter, give it all to God and know that He's in control and it changes my situation, right? That's how powerful worship can be. And prayer, just the same. Prayer can change so many outward circumstances, but it also changes us on the inside. Um, I'm sure, like you, I have been surrounded by some difficult people in my life, um, but God tells us we need to pray for those people. When we begin to pray for those that we feel have wronged us, there's something that changes on the inside of us and God can start to tenderize our heart towards them. We can begin to pray for them and, and forgive them and give them grace and mercy. When we humble ourselves in prayer and worship, it's a sign of us surrendering control and recognizing our frailty, recognizing our lack, recognizing our need for God. And when that happens, then God can get to work. We are like putty or like the illustration we've been using clay in his hands and he begins to mold us. So we talked about being shaped by the word, shaped by prayer and worship. And the last thing I want to talk about is being shaped by our failure. Now this one's not a fun one. Who likes to fail? But it's time we start recognizing that failure isn't necessarily a bad thing if you don't let it stop there. It's okay to fail. We're not perfect and we don't have to pretend to be. Proverbs 24, 16 says, For though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. We have um, the most potential for growth after a failure. It's an opportunity to get back up, to stop, to evaluate, and to take it before God and listen and say, What I do wrong? And allow Him to uh, grow and to develop you. We have several examples in the Bible. You see people mess it up all the time. So we have Abraham, right? God gave him a promise, but God was taking too long. So he took it into his own hands and said, okay, I'll, I'm going to sleep with my maid. And he had a son from her. But then later on, we see when God asked him to sacrifice Isaac, he didn't try to make a way for his own. He knew that God would do it, and he waited patiently. And so God used him. Again, Moses um, killed the Egyptian because of his passion, but later on um, he waited for God's timing and leading, and he was an amazing leader. Peter, he denied Jesus, right? But then he becomes one of the greatest, the main leaders of the early, early church. If you feel like a failure, if you feel like you're just falling apart, I want to give you some encouragement. God can still use you.
several months ago, um, I was in my ladies group and we were reading a book called It's Not Supposed to Be This Way. It's a great book. But in the book, she was using this illustration of pottery. And she was saying that when pottery is actually broken, you can take the dust from the broken pottery and add it to new clay. And when you add it to that new clay, it actually strengthens the clay. It also makes it, um, you can, that vessel can now go through hotter fire than it would have been able to. And then also they say when they glaze that piece, that vessel that they're doing, um, it comes out more beautiful than it would have before. This is some good news. If you feel broken or like a failure, God's not done with you. You're actually in a position to become stronger and bigger and more beautiful than you would have before. So it's up to us how we're gonna to respond to that failure though. We can take our brokenness and we can place it into the potter's hands and see what he can do with us. So let's all picture that for a minute. Here we are, we're clay and God has shaped us in his hands, but there's something missing. Now we need some definition. We need some fine lines. We need some parts cut away. And I believe that um, this is where God uses others in our lives to be a tool in his hands to help sharpen us. And I'm going to share with you three different types of people in our lives um, that can help bring about this sharpening. First is our friends our family, those close to us. Um, our friends should all not look like us, shouldn't act like us. They should be different and have their own gifts and um, uh, they should think differently than us. I have two friends, Morgan and Nicole. We're, all of us are different, but we have such a good time when we come together. And from time to time, we might disagree on something, right? We might uh, not think the same way as the other person, but that's okay. It's how are we going to handle this disagreement, right? In today's culture, many of us look at differences as a bad thing. We want everybody to think like us and talk like us and dress like us and look like us. Um, maybe we look at their differences as uh, something they're lacking. But where one person lacks, another person is strong. We need each other. Uh, the need for someone else is not a negative thing. It's the way God created us to be, to come together as the body of Christ. And one's weakness is another person's strength. And when we are coming together, it's a beautiful thing. Look at the example of Peter and John. So different. Their personality is very different. But they come together. I'm sure they bumped heads from time to time. But they didn't let that separate them. They let that, that strengthen them. And when they came together, God was able to do amazing things through them in their ministry. And he wants to do the same with us. So we need to allow our friends to think differently, to challenge you, to um, take time to look at the other person's perspective and maybe you'll learn something. Second way to be sharpened is the authority that God places in our lives. And sometimes we look at this authority and sometimes it can be a good authority figure and sometimes it can be a bad authority figure. Um, but God puts these authorities in our lives to help sharpen us by building our character. Look at the example of David and Saul. So David knew that he was supposed to be king one day, um, but he had to submit under Saul's authority for a period of time. During that time, I'm sure he was challenged time and time again. It shows us in the scripture where he went through challenge after challenge of being under Saul. Um, but I believe that God used Saul to cut away at maybe some of the pride or arrogance that might have been in David's life. Um, anything that would get in his way when God finally gave David the throne. David had mul multiple opportunities to take Saul out and to place himself on the throne, but he didn't. He allowed um, God to use it to sharpen it. This is an example, I would say, of maybe bad authority, somebody we don't want to submit under. Um, but I have a wonderful example of a good authority figure I had in my life growing up. My mentor was my youth pastor's wife. She was amazing. She was a great teacher. Um, and she also knew when to push us a little bit. So one day she came to me, I was in high school, and she said, I would like you to lead a small group with our middle school girls. Well, this is something I had never done before, and I was like, oh my goodness, I, okay, I'll do it. 
So I did it, and you know what? I survived, and so did the girls. We all survived it. Um, but this was a really growing um, part for me because it she helped me learn um, the potential that I had. She helped me cut away some of those rough edges that needed to be cut away to be able to see see more clearly maybe who I am and who God's creating me to be. Being under authority is an opportunity for us to grow, to allow our character to be strengthened, gifts to be brought out that we maybe didn't know we had, and maybe even for God to show us some of our weaknesses that he wants to strengthen. So we've talked about being sharpened by friends and authority. Now I want to talk about the others in our lives. Uh, these refer to the other people in our lives that maybe we don't like, we don't get along with, they get on our nerves. Whoever those people are, you know. You know who they are. My biblical example of this is the Pharisees, of course. The disciples had to, to put up with the Pharisees all the time, but they didn't allow the Pharisees always uh, challenging them to, to knock them off course. They knew who they were, they knew their truth, and they stuck to it. Uh, they weren't threatened by them in any way. God uses these others in our lives to show us the areas that need to be cut away. Uh, when you get around somebody that you don't necessarily like, what comes out in you? I don't know about you, but for me, it's not the good side. Usually it's the bad and the ugly things that come out um, around those type of people. So let's change the way we see these people in our lives. Let's see them as opportunities. When they treat us bad, we can show them love and forgiveness. When they talk ugly to us, we can talk back with kindness. These other people in our lives are so important for our growth. They are challenging and we can take these challenges and say, what would Jesus do? How would he respond? And allow the sharpening to take place. The carving away of maybe bitterness or jealousy, unforgiveness, pride, all those things that are not of Christ. So church, let's embrace the differences in our friends, allow those in authority to push us, and let us not be shaken by challenging people around us. Accept it all, for when all of these things take place, when our flesh is being cut away from the sharpening of those around us, then we can begin to see the beauty that lies underneath. Who we are starts being more made more clear, and in the end, we will grow from it and be that much closer to being like Jesus. So, growing pains, not fun or easy to go through, but if we want to grow, it has to take place. We have to allow God to shape us through His Word, through prayer and worship, and even through our failures. And we have to allow our friends and those in authority over us and all the others in our lives to help sharpen us, to chisel out the bad so we can see the beautiful. In 2024, some of us might go through some of these growing pains. Are we going to embrace it? I hope so because now we know that this has to happen for growth, to develop who he has created us to be. He sees the finished masterpiece. Are we going to trust our lives into his hands? Are we going to trust that he put these people in our lives for a reason? I hope that we as a church can learn to not only embrace their growing pains, but to learn to look forward to it, knowing that on the other side of that pain is a beautiful masterpiece made in his image. I also want to encourage you, church, if you are not in a growth group this next new year, please get in a growth group. This is the perfect opportunity to put all of this into practice because in a growth group, you're going to get into the word. You're going to pray. You're going to worship and you're going to be surrounded by other people that aren't you. So they're going to challenge you. So let's embrace it, guys, and let's grow from it. I hope that um, you just have such a wonderful New Year's. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I pray blessings upon you and your family, grace and peace.